benvenuti all'Auditorium Santa Margherita, benvenuti a questo incontro speciale offerto da Ca' Foscari, ma in particolare dal Center for the Humanities and Social Change. Change? Sì? Eh, ho avuto un momento di, eh, di cui vi parlerà tra qualche secondo velocemente il professor Shaul Bassi, che è anche l'organizzatore di questo incontro speciale. Eh, questo centro è un centro importante a Ca' Foscari perché, come dice il nome, si occupa delle humanities, delle discipline umanistiche, ma soprattutto delle discipline umane. Eh, e nasce da una eh, serie di eh, appuntamenti, incontri, eh, progetti che Ca' Foscari eh, ha messo in piedi da diversi anni e in qualche modo ne costituisce uno dei, delle punte. Eh, dei gioielli. Io non vi porto via altro tempo, come vedete l'incontro di oggi è un incontro speciale, lo sapete siete qui per questo e quindi vorrei chiamare qui sul palco, without further ado, Laurie Anderson. Che sarà intervistata da Enrico Bettinello. Grazie. E ciao Bassi. And after the storm, I went down to the basement and everything was floating. Lots of old analog keyboards, projectors, props from old shows a big fiberglass plane, a crutch, a Christmas tree stand, countless papers, photographs of our dog. And I looked at them floating there, all the things I had carefully saved all my life. And I thought, how beautiful, how magic, and how catastrophic. It was late. October 2012, and Hurricane Sandy was coming up from the south. It began as a tropical wave in the Western Caribbean and quickly morphed into the biggest Atlantic hurricane on record. I had rushed back to the city to be with Lou when it made landfall. We watched the storm as it blew in across the Hudson River. Then the black water rose up over the banks, crossed the highway, and turned our street into a dark, Silky River. Two days later, I went down to the basement to have a look at the equipment and materials I had assumed were soaked but still salvageable. Nothing was left. The seawater had shredded and pulped everything. Even the electronic equipment was now a lumpy gray sludge. At first, I was devastated. The next day, I realized I would never have to clean the basement again. <laughs> the day after that, I looked at the thick binder with the lists of things that had been lost in the flood. And I realized that since they were no longer objects, they had an entirely different meaning. And that having these long lists was just as good as having the real things, maybe even better. The word yellow. Language is about loss, and in a way, words are memorials to things and to states. The word yellow is a memorial to the color yellow. I began as a painter and a sculptor, and for 40 years I've made drawings, music, paintings, installations, films, sculpture, electronic design, software, opera, and theater. At the root of all of these things are stories. They are the engines. Stories and words are what I love the most. This is a book about the many different strategies I've used to put stories and words into things. Since there are no story museums or museums of narrative art, many of my visual works have been represented as pure visual art instead of the collaborations with words that they actually are. This book is about the development of this process and the catalytic relationships between pictures and stories and about the many codes we use to represent the world. Everything is code. 
Language is an elaborate code. We don't have enough names for things, and so we continue to need new stories to represent life. In addition, the codes are always changing, updating. Even stories in dead languages change with each contemporary translation. I once wrote a song quoting William S. Burroughs titled, Language is a Virus from Outer Space. It always seemed like an odd thing for a writer to say that language is a disease communicable by mouth. But to believe that language is a disease, first, you have to believe that it is alive. So, is language alive? The link between language and outer space also implies that language is deeply foreign from elsewhere, a hard code to crack. Language as code is also a Buddhist concept. In Buddhist thought, there's the thing and then there's the name for the thing and that's one thing too many. This book is about language and live performances the difference between spoken and written words, the influence of the audience, the use of first, second, and third person voices, metaphor, politics as stories, codes, the difference between language and stories, dreams, and songs, misunderstandings, and new meanings that are created when languages are translated. It's the story of how I used words in sculpture, painting, and performance, how they jumped onto screens, and what happens when they began to float in the many worlds of virtual reality. It's the story of how the place and the context influences the text. The chapters include various topics, ice, place, narration, light, film, air, and time. I've omitted technology since technology animates all of them. In each chapter, I look at different strategies for putting language into visual art. That is, into instruments, statues, boxes, installation, film, and performance. It's also the story of my own evolution from carefully crafted scripts and word-for-word -word performances to more immediate forms of art and experience, stand-up comedy, music improv improvisation, and virtual reality. Good evening, welcome to Laurie Anderson, welcome to Enrico Bettinello, welcome to the audience. It's a wonderful experience to be here and to start with the unique voice of a unique artist. Um, we are here because Laurie Anderson has produced another masterpiece of her amazing career. And this is a book, and she's just read a few sections from the introduction that explores her multifaceted career. Um, it's a book, incidentally, that is on sale outside, and so I hope you can have a look into that. Um, Laurie Anderson has been a very generous guest of the Center for the Humanities and Social Change at Kafoskari. Allow me just a few words to uh, explain what our provost, Professor Flavio Grigori, has already explained. Um, the Center for the Humanities and Social Change is a center that works across the Kafoskari department, carries out interdisciplinary research on the most urgent uh, issues of uh, the contemporary world. Um, we engage with issues of migration, we engage with climate change, uh, religion, and um, the importance of narrative that we are going to explore. And and then, after we uh, do our research with the fellows, and most of them are here, and say hello to our fellows, we make an effort to bring our research outside to have an impact on society and to try to facilitate social change. And from the very beginning, when we um, created the center uh, at Kafoskari, we made it clear that we wanted artists to be part of this important conversation. And so um, it was really um, many of us that thought that what an extraordinary thing to start by inviting Laurie Anderson here. And um, what uh, we're going to have 
today is a conversation. Uh, Enrico Bettinello, who's a very well-known critic and, and music expert, will uh, ask some question. I'll ask some question, and then, of course, we are here to listen to uh, what Lori has to say. She has been in Venice for a week, so we've been going to different places. She has explored. We've taken her to some obvious places, less obvious places. More, more about that later. Um, in the meantime, just. Uh, one last thing, I want to thank all the people that have made this event possible, and in particular, Barbara del Mercato. So, now. Okay, so let's start. Uh, the book is uh, really a word, not, a, not just a book. It's full of things and full of uh, um, a lot of documents uh, about uh, all your career. Uh, I would like to start because I, I found it very interesting, and it's uh, placed in the beginning of the book, so it's... Uh, probably a good, pla a good place to start from. Uh, from two of your first performances, uh, As If and Duets uh, on Ice. They are uh, from uh, 1974. And uh, one thing that was very interesting uh, to me, these uh, performances were, were involving violin, but violin uh, became a very interesting tool also to explore other things, and uh, especially uh, Duets on Ice, uh, uh, it was performed uh, in New York, but also in Italy. It was uh, performed in, uh, in Genoa, and I don't know if you have any uh, picture of that. Uh, I do. Yeah, okay, that's fine. And uh, this performance uh, uh, was uh, very interesting because Laurie was uh, playing violin in different uh, places uh, of, uh, of Genova uh, and uh, she was performing and she was playing violin standing on a block of ice so that it was uh, uh, melting and uh, so it was uh, very interesting because uh, uh, as you can see uh, as you can see from the title and from all over our conversation this idea of flooding drowning and uh, it's, it's something that it's a kind of uh, thin red line that connects different aspects of your, of your activity. So, uh, what do you remember of that experience? It was your first experience in Italy, uh, one of your first experiences in Italy with uh, duets on ice and uh, what happened. There are some funny stories about uh, some people in the street helping oh, you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, my very first experience uh, in Italy was here in Venice when I came when I was 14. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, on a bicycle trip. And I had wine for the first time in my life and fell in a canal. And a very handsome uh, boy fished me out. Yeah. So it's always been a story of water for me here what, in Was Venice. this your first performance, probably? Yeah, well, <laughs> it was... Uh, it was um, I, I, I hate to think that I was drunk for my first performance, but... Um, <laughs> I'm going to show you uh, uh, that in a second, but I'm here, I'll show you just a little overview of some of the pictures in the book of, uh, for those of you who want to just get a very quick uh, glam glimpse at things. Um, maybe it's going a little fast. I'm getting a migraine. Okay. <laughs> so those are some flipping through. Um, but here's a picture of uh, Genoa. And uh, the violin that I used, that I designed for this, had a speaker inside. So you could play duets with it live. So you, it, you hear the sound of the violin, you play. Um, and because it was an endless loop, uh, cassette loop, I thought, when does it end? You know, so how does music start? How does it end? Where is it going? So that's why I used the ice as a, uh, as a clock. As a, when the ice melted, concert was over, you know. And um, this guy in the pork pie hat, he showed up at all of these unannounced concerts in Genoa. They were, I never uh, announced them, and, and I, I gave some little um, introduction, dedication before these um, uh, concerts to people who were hanging around. I said, I'm dedicating these concerts, uh, and this is in my very school, school book, Italian, so I, I'm not very good, but I was saying uh, that um, I uh, was dedicating these concerts to my grandmother because on the day she died, I went, went out on a lake, a frozen lake, and I saw a lot of ducks, and they were honking, flapping their wings, 
and they didn't fly away and I got very close to them and they still didn't fly away and I saw that their feet had been frozen into the new layer of ice. Now, the guy who's uh, acting as a kind of maitre d' of the, you know, telling, he's explaining to newcomers in the crowd, she's playing these songs because once she and her grandmother were frozen together in a lake. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I, I, uh, I love what happens between languages. I'm sure it's, it's so much fun to see uh, uh, what, what survives and what just sinks to the bottom. So. And uh, when did you uh, feel the, the needing, f first feel the needing of, uh, of uh, working on Vion's voice? Because also in the other performance, in as if you pour some water in, into the violin, there are a lot of uh, things happening and trying to avoid the usual voice of violin. When it will, that, that this, this th thing start? I mean the, the voice the of the violin? The idea of, of working and uh, modifying the voice of violin. Um, well, for me it was a, a, always a way to do a duet. It was almost like a ventriloquist act in a way, that I could be... Um, and because I like to talk and play, I said it, it would be, I could be the one who's, it's like a ventriloquist with a dummy, and uh, uh, the dummy cries and I talk. So the violin was the more emotional um, part of, of that. And I really liked the dynamics of, of conversation, of duets, of arguments. So I try to get this into uh, work instead of just, endless monologues or I, 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 I. So I, I like to have the, the uh, stress of, um, of two sides. So I've always tried to do that. I think I have some other images of um, that. Uh, many different kinds of ways that I've um, redesigned um, uh, instruments. There is always this idea of, of the stories behind uh, all your work. And uh, it's very interesting when um, uh, what you write in the book about the quality of the stories. Uh, uh, you write that the idea of dealing with true stories uh, in uh, an art world where there was no place for stories back in the 60s, 70s, early 70s. Uh, this is very interesting for me. Has this attitude uh, changed during the years, uh, this attitude of uh, dealing always with true stories, or, or did, did it change? Well, I, I think um, there have been lots of mixtures in terms of literature as well with what's true and what's fiction. Um, those of you who like the work of Karl Nove, of a Nausgaard, for example, uh, who is somebody who uh, has told his true story of his life in such excruciating detail that you you live in his body and that becomes a very strange fictional jump so even I think these lines between um, documentary and fiction often blur but it's true that language hasn't really except in film become uh, uh, so acceptable in visual art you know when you when you go through uh, a, a museum, for example, and you, or let's say the Biennale here, you see all these great visual works and they, they hit your eyes like this and you go like, wow, and you can walk through it. And then you come to the video room and you see the sign that says eight videos, it's going to be like nine hours, and you're like, oh, no, I can't, I can't do it. Because narrative art or those kinds of things, they take time and, and they, they, um, so uh, it, it gets a little bit lost in narrative art. It's, it's not really a, that's why I was saying there's no museum for narrative art. There's a, uh, and, I, and I wish there was a place where you could go and spend more time with uh, things. And I think a little bit that's what's happening with virtual reality, but um, I think visual artists maybe use this in a more uh, um, telegraphic way. For example, you'll often see the title of a picture is, you know, some kind of dream language or something you've seen in a dream. This was a, a code of, I, I, I have all of my dreams um, recorded in a diary and I changed them into another language that I invented for this book, into a code. Also to su suggest that um, 
we have our own private codes. I mean, even we don't understand our own dreams sometimes, but uh, the, that was part of the book too, is looking at, at the codes that we make or, or other, other languages too. These are some images that I did as a sculptor when I started out as a painter and a sculptor. Um, I didn't have any money, so I, I, well, there was a newsstand near my studio and I would always buy newspapers. And so this is the same front page of the New York Times and the China Times. So it, the New York Times is cut in very thin horizontal strips and the China Times in very thin vertical strips and they're woven together. And here's a detail of that. So we talked about ice. Uh, let's change element, uh, Shao. <laughs> let's melt the ice and uh, talk about the ice, water. Okay. Um, talked about stories and literary stories have been a source of inspiration for you for a long time. Uh, we've seen some of the images, the illustrations of the book, but the book is also filled with wonderful stories. You are a very compelling storyteller. Um, we discussed the relationship between water and literature. There's a great tradition of, of course, great books uh, uh, of uh, literature and the sea. And we discussed briefly this famous uh, English uh, poem by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, about three people going to the wedding and they're going to have fun and they're stopped. One of them is stopped by an old sailor, an ancient mariner, who has a story to tell. And this man would like to enjoy the wedding, but no, he's really spellbound and he has to hear. And this is what I think happens in a lot of your stories. So, uh, the, the the more general question is about how comes that at some point a certain literary text um, captures you and you feel the need to do something about it. There's a, among many funny anecdotes, this is also a very funny book if I may say, there's a wonderful story about you wanting to do uh, an opera based on Thomas Pynchon's <laughs> and, <laughs> and maybe you should explain what Thomas Pynchon uh, says, but you know, in general, the Moby Dick is of course the, the, the best example, so how does literature... Uh but I'm glad you mentioned water because I think that um, so many elusive American writers um, and go away from the land to, to look back at the country and when the people who want to paint a picture of their, where they're from they get a little distance. So Ernest Hemingway from the ocean and Mark Twain out on the Mississippi River and uh, Herman Melville uh, out to, to sea. And that's a book that I, I talk a, a little bit about in this book. Um, I love books and often there is a book at the center of, of many of my works. It's maybe the Tibetan Book of the Dead or Moby Dick or, you know, um, a, a number of, of things. but. One thing I should say about uh, books and making work from them is that uh, it's kind of tricky, you know, and, and if you are right now thinking of making an opera from your favorite book, don't do it. <laughs> As a, it's, really, it's really a mistake because, you know, you have to be you have to take your white gloves off. And if you love a book so much that you want to make an opera, you know, you have to be rougher with it. You can't just, you know. Um, so that was uh, I, my mistake. I was felt too polite with it. And it's a book I really love because it has such great jump cuts in it. It's just one, it begins with a guy who says, what should I do? How, how about if I should, I could, I could go to sea. And what, are, what would I do if I went to sea? I could be a captain. No, I hate bossing people around. I could be first mate. No, no, I don't like taking orders. I know I could be a cook because I really like roast chicken. And who doesn't like roast chicken? You know, and the Egyptians like roast chicken. You can tell from their uh, mummies of their uh, chicken and roasted river horse in their giant bakehouses, the pyramids. Now, okay, you're on page three. So where is this going? You know, he's he's like the mind, he's jumping from this to that, it reminds me of this, it reminds So out on, I also love this because it's a story about uh, power and authority and a captain, and in fact a captain who has gone crazy, a great American story. Uh, a ship that's going nowhere with no captain. That's our, that's our story right now. So it's a very American story, a very 
a wonderful one, um, almost like, uh, anyway, uh, in that book, uh, also you mentioned um, uh, Thomas Pynchon, who wrote a book called Gravity's Rainbow. I didn't learn from th this experience of writing Moby Dick opera. Uh, so I wrote to Thomas Pynchon, who is the author of Gravity's Rainbow, a very shy person, very reclusive. He never, you know, you don't even see his picture. He never comes out. And I wrote him saying, I love your book, Gravity's Rainbow. Could I possibly do an opera based on your book? And he said, uh, he wrote back to me and he said, uh, I love your music and uh, yes, you have my permission to do it. With one uh, requirement, which is that the entire opera be scored for solo banjo. Okay, so some people have the nicest way of saying no, 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 not over my dead body. Anyway, so the the book, uh, uh, the opera Moby Dick. In in this book, that uh, all the things I lost to the flood, I, I, I talk about fail a lot of failures and a lot of Plan Bs and what it is to make something that. Eh, it just doesn't work so well. And why didn't it work well? So I tried to look at that and try to see what happened to it. There's another great book that was very important for Melville, that I think was very important for you. It also made it into some of your lyrics, and it's very important for American literature as a whole, and that is the Bible. Um, this morning you went to see Giotto in Padova, and uh, so it seems that the Bible has, you know, usually makes it into uh, wonderful visual culture in Italy, uh, the Catholic country that is, and it traditionally has become a very important influence for literary texts in America and, and especially in other Protestant cultures. So what is your uh, memory of reading the Bible and how did the Bible make it into some of your works? Well, I just... Um remember hearing those stories and thinking they, uh, they were insane, you know, uh, <laughs> just um, talking snakes and, and adults were talking about them. Yes, snakes were talking. You're like, really? And uh, I thought adults were out of their minds, you know. I also had a, a grandmother who was a, a, a missionary and she knew all the Bible stories, and we, and so we, we learned all these stories uh, as as little kids, and and I, I really loved them. I just thought they were um, uh, outrageous. And speaking of of Melville and the Bible, when I was working on this opera, a friend came over, and um, he said, "I have something for you." He had a big box, and he gave me this box, and in it was Melville's Bible, the Bible that he had when he was working on Moby Dick. And I was like, whoa. And uh, I, um, my friend had bought the Bible at Sotheby's and he had taken it to the FBI. And he said, uh, because it's, there were lots of little marks in it, but they'd been erased. And the marks were made by Melville and erased by his wife. Let's say they didn't have the greatest relationship. You know, she's, why are you writing in the family Bible? So she erased everything, everything, every page. So my friend said, what, you know, the FBI said, well, uh, it's too late. You know, we, uh, if it was 100 years, maybe, but 150 plus, no, we can't tell you what was erased. So I went through this Bible page by page with a magnifying glass and just looking for any word that said whale or Leviathan, the biblical word for whale, and I found it in Isaiah 27, 1. Built with stars, circles, things going, arrows like this. And it was, um, and the Lord shall smote Leviathan, that piercing serpent that is in the sea. And I thought, oh, whoa. There it is in print uh, that, you know, the whale is the snake and the ocean is his garden where Belleville works out his ideas of good and evil. And and so um, it was really, really shocking to, to see that. Because you had the feeling, you know, it's such a it's such a crazy story of evil and good and it's all a little bit a little bit Shakespearean, a little bit too much. 
you know, so I, I was watching, I mean, many 19th century American novels are based on two things, Shakespeare and the Bible. And they get kind of mixed up, and so in a way you have this crazy Captain Ahab is kind of like a, an American Lear, you know, he's angry, he's so angry, he has a terrible rage, and you don't really know, understand really what it is, but it drives him, uh, and, and what he looks for eats him in the end. This, this great symbol of evil eats him alive, so it's quite a, quite a book. <laughs> well, the title of your book, All the Things I Lost in the Flood, are kind of, you know, is a bit biblical. Yeah. One can help thinking about the flood. So, is this book a kind of Noah's Ark for you that uh, has? Uh, been oh, I guess I tried to save a few animals. Um, yeah, it's a it, it's a way to to gather things up and and count them up, I guess, and um, and I suppose save things. Yeah, it is a little bit of a, of a scrapbook in that way. I mean, I I don't think of myself as a, too much of a pack rat, but I guess I am. <laughs> Okay, let's go back to your the, the introduction. In, in your introduction, you uh, that you kindly read, uh, you stated that uh, uh, technology is something that uh, animates uh, all the topics of the book. You you didn't have a topic about technology because it it's it's uh, it, it's, it's everywhere. <laughs> Don't say bad things about it. Well, yeah. <laughs> Just an example, okay? Understand? Okay. And uh, I don't know if it was mine or there. And uh, uh, I think, of course, that is something that immediately identifies your work when we talk about technology. And, uh, and another thing is that during these weeks there is an exhibition of yours in, uh, at Virginia Tech that is about uh, your invented instruments and we, uh, uh, we, we can s stay here for hours t and talk about, we, we won't, uh, uh, and talk about uh, your invented instrument. Uh, maybe you have also some, some examples, the tape about violin, the handphone table, that is uh, fantastic to me, the talking stick and all these instruments that you invented to, to open up your, your, uh, your creative world and what fascinates is and what what and inspires you in uh, the most about the idea of uh, uh, making things talk what what's the behind the idea of making things talk I know that you had this uh, very uh, impressive uh, uh, feeling with uh, Robert Morris box back in the yeah yeah, that's a that's a not exactly a talking box, but he was a minimal sculptor, and in the '60s he made something called a box with the sound of its own making, and he recorded all the sounds that were made when he was sawing er, and hammering, and putting the box together, and he put those sounds inside the box, and I loved that. Um, it was almost like a talking box telling its own history, how I got here, and and I do feel that. Um, uh, there, that there are stories in material and that also even uh, in a very literal way one of the, the, the experiments that I always really loved so much was um, something they had done by Bell Labs in a very early days um, they had two people in a, in a room and they recorded a conversation and then they sealed the room and they measured uh, the uh, motion of the sound waves of the voices uh, going back and forth between the, these this man and the woman and their conversation. And those disturbances of the air lasted for 10 years. So we're leaving all of these traces. And also, uh, I, one of the examples that I use in an instrument that I'm making now actually is a, it's in a kind of apocryphal story. It's a story of a, a vase that, uh, uh, a Japanese vase that had very thinly inscribed grooves, very, very delicate grooves all the way around it, the vase. And uh, this acoustician said, you know, if we had a three-dimensional record player, we could 
maybe hear the, the sounds of the potter potting the pot because that's how records are made. You make a sound and their and their grooves are cut in the record that record the sound waves and reproduce them. So I thought uh, that would be a wonderful thing to to make. So uh, I'm, I'm making one of those pots now uh, a lot later. But a lot of these early works like this one, which is uh, um, uh, using a sound of a violin that comes and goes with the breath as, as the flame passes, um, as the breath moves the flame, uh, the elements of, of language and uh, breath and sound. And different violins that I've made, this is just a, one that was um, in, filled with neon, so it had that sound that we just heard, like, <laughs> you know, it's a really, uh, really fantastic sound. Uh, this is a biophonograph that had different tones on each um, uh, groove, so that, and a needle in the bow, so that you could, I think I have a picture of playing it. It's a, a violin, it sounded terrible, actually. It was, but I really did like it. This is an early computer violin that I used. And uh, this is a, the Moby Dick uh, instrument, a talking stick. And uh, I, I, used, I made that because the people in this opera, yeah, it's a, it was a digital, digital music, so it was more, more or less laptops and synths and things like this. And, you know, I, I, I just, it's kind of boring to watch people, you know, play la their laptop, really. Um, it's, or their synthesizer, even, you know, it's almost as interesting as watching someone iron, you know, you're like, oh, okay. I mean, some people move a little bit more to make them more, but, but I like instruments where you use your body, like saxophone, violin, you really need your, your arms, your, your whole body, your back, you know, you move into it. So this was a harpoon instrument, but it was digital, so you had to, to move it up and down this way, and you had to, um, Use a, it works with granular synthesis, a kind of a uh, crazy breaking up of the sound, and then uh, accessing different kinds of of um, sounds. Um, this was a, a character that I invented to change the voice, uh, and I, and this was uh, I invented a filter, <laughs> and uh, so then several of the uh, characters that that I made, um, basically it's audio drag, and I highly recommend it. It's, it's really, really fun to stop using your own voice, you know, which can get so tiring. I mean, I, even right now I'm just feeling so sick of my own voice. I mean, it's like, you know, when you're in the middle of a conversation and somebody's droning on and on and blah, 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 and then you realize it's me. Uh, that's my voice talking in. <laughs> Okay, well, you know, so I invented a l different ways to get out of that trap, and also out of the trap that that think you know it, it, it tries to convince you that you always have to promote your point of view, your own point of view, which is just tiresome. So I tried to get a lot of alter egos so that I could have some other point of view, or change the scale. This is a a really tiny little clay figure. So in the corner you see it in a big room and it's telling a story, of, or a kind of a complicated story, so you have to kind of crawl over to it and listen to it, so it goes, come here, come here, you know. So, um, and this is a, some stories in a pillow, so you get to rest while you're listening to it. And this is the one that you mentioned, yeah. the handphone That's table. very interesting. Yeah, and that is a table so that works bone, with bone conduction, so you put your elbows on the table and your hands over your ears and you hear very powerful sound. And I just rebuilt this and with a lot of uh, new electronics. So this is the way it works. There's the sound source inside the table. And uh, it, it's driven up a driver and then it comes through your bones and into your head. And the way that you receive it with your head in your hands, sort of depressed point, you know, body language is, is um, really about how I invented it too. I was working on an electric typewriter and in the days of electric typewriters, and uh, I was reading what I'd written, and it was so stupid. I just was, oh, who, you think you're a writer? This is just terrible. And so I put my head in my hands, and I was like, oh. And then I heard this, you know, 
of the motor coming through the vibrating the table and coming up through my bones and into my head. I thought, I'm going to build a singing table. So this is the singing table. And uh, it works, bass frequencies are very easy to control. So they, I used Fender Rhodes and low end sounds because they have waves like this. Now, if you try to use language, it gets difficult because language is made of fricatives. So all of the all those things. Otherwise, it sounds like that without the definition of the, those. And those frequencies are very hard to control. They're always skittering all over the place. They're just so finally, I found a way to do that, to push them through this with filters, electronic filters, and so. The first words that I, I used were a 17th century British metaphysical love poet named George Herbert who wrote a, a poem to music which was, now I and you without a body move. So in one year you hear, now I and you without a body, and then move slowly, pans from left to right. And this is um, a version that we made in Rio because it's so loud in Rio. There's just so many people and I thought, well maybe, you know, you can be with a, a group of people in a kind of silence. And some, just a couple more of these. This is an earring that screams into your ear uh, with instructions about what to do next. Um, this is a, I was asked to do a music box by a Swiss company and they, so I, I'm not the kind of sculptor who likes new forms. I, I just don't, there's so many forms in the world already, you know, I think maybe I use some ones that are already there. So this is just a, a level a carpenter's tool and and there's a little speaker on one side with a voice of a woman and speaker on the other side with the voice of a man and it, when it's tilted, it's called tilt, she sings alone and then he sings alone and then uh, this little windsurfer guy um, balances them so that they, when you're level they sing a duet. I think this, uh, this is very interesting and fascinating. I did interview uh, dozens of uh, composers and artists from many languages and uh, one thing that always, uh, it's, it's always presented is that they uh, are really proud of their own voice. They say, oh, I, I really searched for my own voice. This is my voice. My, uh, I am recognizable with for my voice. And in, in your work it's very interesting because it's uh, recognizable but this uh, idea of uh, avoiding the, the usual voice is, is super interesting. It reminds me a little bit about uh, Alvin Lussier in, in another way that is a, a, a composer that try, try, uh, tends to uh, disappear, to hide behind the sound. You don't, don't say okay this is uh, like uh, Jimi Hendrix, you recognize his guitar, and or John Coltrane, you say, okay, this is his saxophone. And this idea of, uh, of uh, avoiding uh, having just one voice is something that, that is uh, really, really interesting for me. I don't know if, uh, is even for Shao. Well, coming here on the Vaporetto, I met a group of school kids from Rome, they were visiting, and there was this little Matteo who asked me, where are you from, Venice? If I oh, why do you have these strange accents in Venice? And he was really <laughs> struck by the fact that in Venice we have, have, a, have, a, have a weird accent. But um, the, the experimental nature of, of most of your works doesn't uh, actually take away from the fact that there are moments where, in fact, you are very comfortable with the traditional forms. And since the Center for the Humanities and Social Change has invited you to be or to consider being an artist in residence there is a cautionary tale in this book when you describe there's a whole chapter about your experience of being an artist in residence at nasa the famous uh, space agency and if you don't mind i'll just quote a couple of lines so uh laurie anderson vis is invited at nasa she visits all the most amazing technological achievements of the mythical legendary space agency I think NASA asked me to do this residency because I'm a multimedia artist and they thought I might come up with some sexy techno project like bouncing light off one satellite onto another and lighting up the dark side of the moon. So when I said I was going to do a long poem, their faces fell. A poem.
poem? What would you do a poem? <laughs> I tried again, an epic poem I elaborated. So um, it's really a, a very interesting chapter. Um, just to mention that we, if you end up writing an epic poem about Venice, there will be no complaint from us. <laughs> but we are very uh, grateful that you have taken the time to consider um, engaging with Venice. Venice, we discussed that, it's a very difficult subject. Venice is a city made of wonderful monuments, of stones, but traditionally it's also been made of stories, and every new generation needs new stories to appreciate the city. Um, so, we've learned about your first experience of Venice. Um, without elaborating too much, but can you tell us something about your experience, uh, of your first impression? You've been to Venice many times with different art projects. You've been at the Biennale. With, you've uh, made some memorable concerts here when Enrico was uh, involved. But can you just simply tell us something about your impressions of, of uh, and maybe share with the audience some of the places that you visited in these days? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I want to preface this by, um, I think it's it's what uh, you're doing in this, in this organization is, is really amazing because you jump disciplines and you kind of go, well, how should we look at that? And I find that completely fascinating. And, and because we have much more cross-disciplinary things in common than, than we think. I mean, and before I talk about, about Venice specifically, I, I, I have to say, like, for example, at NASA, um, uh, how there with, uh, you know, my badge that says artisan residence at NASA with a little space cartoon rocket and nobody said, oh, do we have an artist in residence? No. But artists and, and scientists had, have much more in common than, uh, than we think because we, we do things in very similar ways. We make something and then we go, what is this? What, what does that do? And, and uh, I think it was uh, uh, um, a, th that, that ki those kinds of questions you can t look at in many different uh, levels and, and, and disciplines of design and, and planning and thinking of what, what do we do, for example, about the water? What do we do about um, ice? What do we, you know, so I, I've had to um, jump into many of those questions because they're the questions of our time and I'm, I'm a, a, an artist who tries to, to describe not proscribe anything. I do not that I would. I don't know what to do about anything. I should just say, uh, um, and uh, also, I, I, in terms of political situations, I mean, a lot of the art that I do ha has political ramifications. But I try very, very, very hard to just be someone who describes things well and never says you should do this because. I don't know, and and also I really hate it when people tell me what to do. You know, I just hate it. I think you don't even know me. Don't tell me what to do. So I try to be a very good observer and to be a good documentarian. Just kind of ask some questions. So that that's um, how I try to always start. Um, and at NASA, that was. I should just say one more thing about that, which was. The, some of the most interesting conversations I had there were with the nanotechnologists because they were they were kind of the dreamers. They weren't the engineers, the robotics guys. They were there, kind of like thinking, well, uh, what is this? What? Are, what? Why? What? You know. And so they were always uh, saying, quoting Einstein, saying that he had rejected some of his most well-known theories, and why? Because he said they weren't beautiful. You think, what does that mean? What does that mean for a, for Einstein, let's say, a mathematician who says that? And what would that mean in his in his time? What would beauty mean? Yeah. And so we had to think of like, okay, symmetry maybe um, is something that was considered uh, beautiful by Einstein, and and so therefore he would be more attracted to the truthfulness of that situation. But if you take this idea, for example, out of its context to Japan, they think symmetry is idiotic. Two things, that looks like that, what, that makes it better? Why? Uh, because you have two eyes, bicameral brain, two hands. What is it that makes this lining up of things so 
so beautiful? Uh, and so, of course, their answer to uh, our form of poetry, which is comparative, a rose is feels like this, or it, it looks like this, or it reminds you of this. There's a parallel structure of a thing in it, what it means, a thing in what it means. And we like that. We call that art. But in Japan, you can have a, you have the haiku. It doesn't compare to anything. It just says, cloudy day, the puppeteer coughed. That's the poem. It's not reminds you of this or reminds you of death or reminds you of life or it's just a, it's just a, a, a description of a moment. So I'm very attracted to seeing how people uh, see things and particularly what makes them see something as beautiful. So uh, in looking around here at various solutions to problems and, and also uh, uh, beautiful things, yesterday we got to go and see Moe's and go down into the tunnel which was uh, awesome, really. I have to say it was, and I and I had had gone to this with the preface of everybody saying, "This is like just a, the worst project ever." You know, I can't believe what's going on with this, and so I had a very kind of, let's say, a bit of a negative um, approach to it. But when I saw it, I just, uh, uh, I hope it works. Let's say, let's say, let's say that, but it's, it's, um, it's such an amazing uh, idea and, and the effort that has gone into something like this um, is, uh, uh, and of course here I am a complete stranger and, and I, I uh, have, haven't the slightest idea what it's really like to, to live with that and wonder whether it works. I know that we have the same, a similar situation, but it's uh, more dire. We have a, we spend you know 90% of our national budget on so-called defense. In fact, NASA is mostly a defense organization, and uh, so we don't know if that works, and we don't want to find out. So um, it, it's uh, all of these these. Um, Somebody at the New York Times asked me recently what um, uh, people have in common, and um, what is the thing that everybody has in common? I'm thinking and thinking. I don't know. Like, could it be empathy? Not really. You know, some people who have no empathy. Joy? No. Um, uh, curiosity? Maybe as a kid, and then some people, most many, lose it. Fear. Fear is what we have in common. So, so when you make something that will will look at fear and try to make things uh, not as frightening, of course, it's it's very um, appealing to people. Um, back to NASA uh, and fear and their budget. Uh, I should say that you know I was not just the first artist in residence at NASA. I was also the last. Okay, so, so one of the senators is going through the budget, and again, it's a military budget, and he's looking at it, and he's going, oh, okay, 30 trillion for spy satellites, yes. 80 billion for, you know, some other kind of, basically, military surveillance projects. It is no longer going to space, and uh, it's going to space and looking back down on Earth. It's going back the other way. It's not that, it's that. Um, and... Um, the uh, so anyway, um, he's looking at that, and he, then he sees on the budget twenty thousand dollars for an artist in residence. He said, "This is an outrage! What do we?" Do? He's a whistleblower. He's, you know, let's get rid of this artist in residence thing. It's just like, and so I'm trying to reinstate it, not for myself, but really for other artists, because I think I think there should be an artist in residence in in. Uh, in Congress, I think there should be an artist in residence in the White House, uh, in the Supreme Court. Uh, artists have a different way of seeing things, and I, and I so that's another thing I appreciate about this uh, effort here to make these cross uh, crosses between disciplines. Is it's very very important uh, to not let uh, the the uh, the rush to um, 
to the, the rush that all of capitalism is in, is in to just like push to to do things that we you know might want to reconsider from other um, points of view. So um, the uh, other thing that about um, oh, I was just thinking when I was thinking of the surveillance things that look back down on the earth of a really interesting lawsuit now that's in the international courts. And I'm working on a virtual reality thing now about the moon because there are lots of moon, uh, big moon um, anniversaries coming up. The first person on the moon, the first one. So, but anyway, the, China has, has entered a lawsuit in the international courts claiming that China owns the moon. And, you know, why not give it a shot, you know? So there they feel that China owns the moon, of course, the Russians are completely outraged, and and the uh, you know and the Americans are like, you know, um, we uh, we put the first man on the moon, and, and then of course you know Italy comes and goes. We saw it first, <laughs> you know. So who owns the moon? You know, the ones who were there and planted their flag, or the ones who you know, hey. So anyway, um, uh, I I think it was uh, in in this age of of um, of uh, ownership, which even extends to our own presentation of ourselves, and you know, when you work on your Facebook branding kind of thing, you you realize, wow, it's it's kind of like a product-oriented thing. You have to present yourself in a way that's coherent and um, clear, and then you, you you get trapped in that little box, you know, of, and the people, you know, um, kind of uh, get annoyed if you say something out of character when when I, I think uh, it's really good to be out of character more or less. I'm sorry I'm rambling just <laughs> what, I, what else should we talk about no I just want to interject and, and explain very briefly that since this book is about the devastation provoked by a hurricane that um, we inaugurated the climate change the humanity and social change uh, effort a year ago with uh, the Indian writer Amitav Ghosh talking about humanities and climate change. Climate change has been very much at the center of our thinking and when we try to plan this what we hope it will be the first week of, of Laurie Anderson as our arts in residence we said let's put water at the center of our um, exploration and so not only did we take her to see the Mose, but also she explored the lagoon with some friends who are here. So we really wanted her to see the city from the water as much as possible. So that's why we went to see this bizarre yesterday when we were there. I said, well, maybe she wanted to see, I don't know, the Dodge's Palace and we're here underwater and this you know, bunker in the <laughs> wearing. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, let's talk about some music. Yes, let's go back to the music and let's go back to the music that we were listening to when we entered the, the room there was this background music that was very sweet and uh, it's something that goes back uh, to the 70s it's a, it's a quartet let's say that that you uh, that was inspired and that, that you dedicated to the artist Saul Lewitt okay that you, you started with him yeah okay and uh, can you tell us something about, because it's very interesting, because this quartet is uh, made out uh, of, uh, was inspired by uh, what is, can be uh, now perce be perceived as a graphic score, but it wasn't intended as a graphic score because it was a Soluit work. What, mm, how did you work on, out of this? Uh, there is a, the, she doesn't have the, the, you don't have the, the image of this, the score, no. But there, there is this image of uh, of uh, the the uh, solute uh, work that is made of some squares with some numbers inside, and you uh, took the inspiration. I'm not really sure what he, uh, what kind of code he thought it was. I don't know what was in his mind, but uh, he made really beautiful paintings and sculptures, very very simple, based on number series and um, it sounds a little cold but it, they're they're breathtaking and uh, um, so I was looking at these these boxes with filled with little numbers one through four and I was thinking oh that would make a really nice score for a quartet 
And so I made a quartet based on those number series. And it's, well, you heard it as you came in. It's, it's very even, it's, it's not, it's all quarter notes, exactly the, you know, and so it, that if you restrain things um, uh, to their, to the simplest elements, you know, it, it sometimes you can hear the number progressions. And so there, there, it's some dissonance in it as well. So um, you're the first people to hear that quartet. How did you work at this score? There are a, a kind of textual part and, and a musical part. How did you work on this score for the Kronos Quartet? Uh, I, uh, the Kronos Quartet is just an amazing uh, group. And they said, would you write a quartet for us? And I said, no way. I, I don't know how to write a quartet. And, and David Harrington, who's the first violinist, is such a nice guy. He said, just, just try it. I mean, it's not that hard. I was like, really? <laughs> so I, I made a lot of electronic filters for my own instrument, which is basically a viola. And it's got a, it's a hopped violin, but it has a low C string. So I, I made a lot of filters that made it, you could have like minor thirds plus octaves below. And so it, that generated the other parts. And so that, that was really how I, I made it. And then um, it was just going to be instrumental. And then I, then as I went through it, I, I couldn't resist uh, adding some words. But it was a big thrill for me. I'm a not so good violinist. I'm a good electronic violinist, but uh, to play with these guys, was, I was like the fifth wheel, and they were like, and I was like a free violin lesson, because I'm watching them play. Was, really, they had such great technique. And so we had a, we had a good time uh, doing this this work that fall. Did, do you, do you do you see your, yourself as a, as a composer at all, or is something that is because you, you've been part of this uh, unbelievable scene during the 70s in New York, a lot of uh, arts that were and uh, you can call kind of intermedia affairs between uh, visual arts and music and uh, different kind of music, uh, even the barriers and the labels of the music really were mean meaningless uh, in, uh, at those time uh, and thankful. Uh, and uh, uh, what, what, how did this change, did this scene change? Do you think has changed, there is something going on that resembles uh, these, uh, those days for, for you today? Yes, I do, and um, uh, maybe you could just say a word about Glenn Branca. Yeah, I didn't want to put this kind of sad things, but today uh, another uh, great uh, composer from uh, those years, Glenn Branca, died. Unfortunately, he was uh, just uh, 69 and he was ill, and uh, you, yesterday, yesterday probably, or tonight, I don't Yes, yesterday, and uh, he was part of this uh, uh, scene. Probably you weren't that so close to him, or you know, not. No, we were. We played in a lot of different, yeah. uh, a lot of the same things, a lot of the same. We were in the same scene, and, uh, and it was a pretty big scene. And strangely, this kind of wall of sound and immersive thing is is really coming back, and uh, in in many really interesting ways. And and um, I've been doing a lot of these. Um, uh, things with um, uh, guitars and there are installations of uh, Lou Reed's guitars and he has he would um, did some things that with feedback he would lean the guitars against amps and do these very special tunings with the guitar with the strings and with the amps and create these feedback loops that with harmonics and overtones that were just so he heavenly just re and unpredictable and beautiful so so we're doing a lot of, we've done maybe 15 of these in different places, in different music festivals in the last few couple of years. And uh, and it's it's thrilling because I don't know what this kind of music is called. I mean, we the last time we did it was, I guess, maybe Brighton. And we did it in a huge church and with a big mirror ball and, you know, and um, mirror balls help everything. You know, and the sound was so, intense and physical and you know when you're get, listening to your little you know tiny little horrible little you know headphones there 
you know, music has disintegrated to just being like MP3s with no, you know, so when, you, that's one of the most interesting sound developments that's happening now is you can go to these big places where you hear sound in such, with such intensity and whether it's a rave or whether it's a sound installation, it has this, this overpowering sense of waves hitting you. So um, these installations are very exciting to me. And what even more exciting was the times when we've done these and people just show up with their instruments, mostly saxophones and things like this, and they just to play. Uh, and uh, I think, what is this? It's a new art form. It's not people in a in an audience looking at people on a stage who play and then and then they leave but it's walking into the music and it's very visceral and it's really uh, just a new art form but but I remember Glenn Branca doing that you know in the 70s you would like create, make the whole club just vibrate like that it was really intense thank you for this memory of Glenn Branca that uh, it's yeah. been a great uh, artist Shaul, we are running out of time, or yes, no? Yes, but um, I think I have a last question that okay. is very important for, for us. Uh, the Humanities and Social Change Center focuses on cultural pluralism as our overarching theme. And this is a very politically urgent issue. Um, and you've described how your art has been very political in many ways. And many of our fellows work on migration, on the need to has a bridge between cultures and a moment where there seems to be more and more walls, fences, and, and terrible, um, violent uh, clashes between peoples. And there's one work that you describe and that you can also illustrate here, which is habeas corpus, uh, which is an extraordinary uh, way of, of dealing with the situation that um, was provoked by 9-11 and what happened afterwards. Could you say something about habeas corpus and um, your Yeah, I could, I could also this. say that um, it um, originated uh, in Genoa, uh, in uh, Milan, actually. Uh, it was the first time I, I did this. I was trying to do a sound installation in Vienna, and it was not working. And uh, I um, was desperate for an idea, and it was just reverb, and so I it was in a 13th century church, so I climbed to the bell tower there, and I looked down, and in the middle of this perfect little Austrian town was a maximum security prison. And then over there was a guard tower with a guy with a machine gun. So I'm in the bell tower, he's in the guard tower, I'm thinking, whoa. So I came down the stairs and I said to the curators, I'm going to do something about telepresence, the function of telepresence in our culture. Uh, and we're going to build a video studio in the prison and we're gonna have a prisoner, this is in 1997, sit very still, very, very still, and and film him, stream, live stream him, and then make a life-size cast of this prisoner and put him in the church and stream his image uh, and wrap it onto his, uh, project, his body. So it's like a living sculpture. And it would be about the attitudes of the church and the prison to the body. So incarnation, incarceration, there, not there. Surprisingly, the curators go, okay. I was like, really? Oh, okay. <laughs> this advanced a few. So um, we didn't do it because Austrian law forbids the prisoner no longer owns his own image. Uh, it's a 21st century situation as well. Who owns your image? What can they do with your image when they put it up and who? who owns it. So anyway, I, I didn't do it there. I'm going to jump through some other things to find this. Um, we're going to jump through a parrot, with a talking parrot, and we're going to go and see uh, uh, Santino, who was, uh, uh, I eventually did this in uh, San Vittorio prison in Milan in collaboration with the Prada Foundation. And it became something about uh, basically what you keep in a in a uh, guarded institution you know what what happens and it and became also about time and this was called dal vivo from life and it was originally the title of it was life because it was uh, about life imprisonment and time and presence and stillness and so uh, he had learned to 
to Santino, had learned to be uh, sit there for several months. Here's his is the cast that he did. Now I always wanted to do this in the. This was again in '98, I guess. I wanted to do this in the United States because we have the largest prison population in the world. One of every 100 Americans is in prison. And um, guess when the number of bad guys shot up? Well, when the prisons became privatized. And so when, when prisons become business, what do you need? Customers. So you, we were, they were brought in under a, a really crazy drug law that said if you're holding a joint, holding it, not smoking it, not selling it, you can get 25 years to life. So they brought a lot of these people in who were holding a joint and they were in prison for life. So I thought, okay, I'm going to maybe do something. So I was asked to do something, the Park Avenue Armory. And I thought I'll oh, maybe do something like this or, or stream, put cameras in 12 prisons and, and uh, stream them into, um, and have the images, you know, wrapped onto these, and it would be like some Egyptian hallway, you know, of time and 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 stillness. And now, uh, this was proceeding, and I was it was working, and then Homeland Security got in touch with me and said, "You will never do this project in the U.S." I was like, "Okay." So the director says, "What's your Plan B?" I said, "Plan B, Plan B. Don't have a Plan B." So my Plan B. Uh, was uh, to make the whole place into kind of a western uh, plains with little miniature cowboys, little kids who were wearing like um, pasted beards, and they had little cowboy hats and tiny ponies and weather kind of rushing through this landscape. It was a crazy idea and different, different parades of events from American culture. They, Kennedy Cadillac, and here's some in their chaponies. And now, because they had to work way ahead of time, they decided we need we need to have some press photos of this project. And, and this wasn't even a project; this was an idea. So, I brought some miniature ponies into the this place, and we did a lot of photo shoots with them. And here's more more and more ponies, and uh, and uh, they made posters and things for magazines out of this, and I was like, well, wait a second. Um, so what, I, what happened then, and I'll try to tell you th this very quickly, was I was very unhappy with Plan B. And so a friend uh, got me in touch with someone from uh, a group called Reprieve, which is a group in London that represents uh, prisoners on death row in the United States and Guantanamo uh, prisoners, detainees. And eventually, after a month or so of talking, um, I, I was explaining this project to the, the lawyers there, and I said, you know, I'm looking for someone who would collaborate with me and, uh, and do the, someone who might be interested in sitting very still and, you know. And she said, finally, I want you to meet someone, and she introduced me to a man named uh, Mohammed al Garani. He was the youngest uh, detainee at Guantanamo, and and here's how here's how language and stories work. He was a, a young boy when he was he was captured when he was 12, and he was kept until he was 21. He was tortured. He was cut everywhere. He was put in solitary. He was ruined. Now we are not allowed to say that, of course. Uh, we American doctors. Uh, and psychiatrists were at every torture session. We were not allowed to say that. We were allowed to say the American science behavioral teams were at every session with the detainees. This is how it works. How we got these prisoners in the first place, what we did, again, language. We declared them non-persons, number one, non-persons. So they had no access to the Geneva Convention. They had no rights. So. So that was the first way that they were given nothing. I was the first American that Mohammed had met who was not his torturer or his guard. So I said, Mohammed, you know, I want, and he is, then it was out because he was never accused because he had never been charged. 
He was just tortured. So um, it's also a question of, you know, we were looking for Saudis, people with a certain profile. They had to, have, they had to be Saudis because they were our enemies. So we brought the Saudis in. So anyway, um, uh, he was also someone who was, uh, was told wonderful stories about what had happened to him and how, how this happened to him. Um, and to give you an idea of the illusion of this, one of his fellow detainees had told one of his guards uh, that he had a dream that a submarine had come to rescue all the detainees in Guantanamo. And that night, the whole Guantanamo Bay was filled with American ships and helicopters looking for the submarine that this guy had dreamed. This is a dark dream. This is an insane dark dream that is a reality. And so watching Muhammad's story versus the US government story was fascinating. So I decided, of course, Guantanamo detainees are not allowed to come to the United States. Their, their lives are made very miserable even after they're freed. So I said, um, I want to jump them in virtually. So what we did in the Park Avenue Armory was we built a statue. We, first of all, we built a, a studio in, in, in Africa, where West Africa, where Mohammed is more or less imprisoned now, house arrest. And um, he learned to sit very still. And we bounced him in and made a statue the size of the Lincoln Memorial. And there's the mirror ball, of course. Um, and he um, sat there. And these are some of the drones. Uh, he spoke about some of the things. This is from the side. And here's what happened. You know how you know, how you know where cameras are? You know, you know when you're in a parking lot or wherever, you know, oh, there's one over there, there's one over here. People knew that in this huge place, um, there was a camera up in the ceiling so that Muhammad in Africa could see how his image was being projected onto the statue. And if he needed to move a little bit, we would call him on the phone and say, okay, Muhammad, move your little finger this way, just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. And of course, then the statue would move like that because it was much bigger than life. And uh, so people um, realized that if they stood with their back to the statue, he could see them. And it, from Africa, in almost real time, and I didn't have an audio feed because I didn't want people calling him a terrorist yet again or an immigrant, or whatever, you know, so. Um, but they had read his story and, and seen, they, had, they saw the, the whole thing, you know, that we, we also provided the legal uh, briefs that were this much, you know, of, of this, his so-called accusations. And um, so they stood in front of this camera and they, they brought guitars, they played for him, they held up signs, and mostly they just tried to, they, you know, moved their mouths like, I'm sorry. Sorry. And it was uh, one of the most intense moments of my life as an artist to be able to just make a little channel between uh, worlds that um, uh, could then suddenly uh, see beyond the the the, um, the story that was the so-called official story. But anyway, that's Mohammed. And I talked to him recently, and, and I said, Mohammed, what, what, what's on your mind these days? And what he said was, he, he said, you know, I, I'm really interested in um, working on women's rights. I was like, some people are so enlightened. I mean, and their suffering uh, does something to them that opens them in a way that you, you, takes your breath away. So Mohammed is one of those people. And uh, he was, one of the, his really crazy moments was, Cueco Mandela came to, to this exhibition and um, Mandela's grandson, and, and Mohammed had read m many of Mandela's works in prison. And we said, you know, Cueco Mandela is here. And he said, and that's the only time, he would only cry when, when 
people were kind to him. You know? So he just, uh, he said, you mean I'm on the on a statue the size of the American president who emancipated the slaves, and Quaker Mandela is standing here looking at me, and he just went like this. And the whole statue kind of moved. You know? <laughs> it's really kind of crazy moment. But anyway, that was um, that project. Well, thank you very much. Uh, one of our latest events uh, at the center was uh, a day f uh, fully devoted to the relationship between Europe and Africa. And the next event, if I may use this moment to advertise our next conference, is a, a symposium called the Fountainheads of Toleration. We are going to explore the different traditions of toleration and tolerance in, in the West, in China, in India, and to get out of this idea that toleration is somehow just a, a Western concept. We're going to have a comparative view. It's we, amazing they tolerate us. Exactly. <laughs> Um, of course, we could speak uh, about so many themes about uh, an over, but uh, of course, we want to have Laurie Anderson back before too long. So in the meantime, let me thank Enrico Bettinello for uh, joining me in this conversation, uh, Flavio Gregori for hosting us, uh, Barbara Gann, the interpreter that have translated Laurie Anderson's work, the audience, the staff, uh, all the things are lost in the flood, essays on pictures, language, and code, Laurie Anderson.